Hi, this is Dr. Lownan, and in this video lecture, I'm going to talk a little bit in general ways about bacterial pathogens while giving you a few specific examples as we go along. A pathogen is a microbe that causes disease through infection. Pathogens can be bacterial, archaeal, but rarely viral, protozoan, or fungal. Here we're going to focus on the bacterial ones. Before we do that, let's talk about the term virulence and virulence factor. Virulence is sometimes referred to as pathogenicity, and virulence factors are also known as pathogenicity factors. Virulence is a measure of the ability of a microbe to be a pathogen or to be pathogenic. It is a measure of its ability to be harmful. A virulence factor is some aspect of a microbe's form or function that allows it to be a pathogen. And I know those definitions are a little circular. Here's an analogy. Here's me, garden variety human, causing nobody harm at all, completely avirulent or, generally speaking, lacking in the ability to be harmful. And here's a deadly ninja who could be con very virulent, considered highly virulent, very deadly, right? And so what is it about this human versus this human that allows this one to be harmful or deadly? Well, something about the form or the function. The sword is part of the form. The function would be the ability of this trained ninja to kill. And those aspects would make this human quite deadly or virulent, so with the help of the virulence factors, and this one less so. So what are some bacterial virulence factors? You can split those factors up into offensive ones or attack ones or defensive ones. So an example of an offensive um, factor is a toxin. And in this particular cartoon that I've drawn for you, we've got a microbe shown here. So this is supposed to be a bacterium. And this particular bacterium is supposed to be a gram negative bacterium. And it's a gram-negative bacterium, and I've drawn the chromosome, the cytoplasm is through here, these little dots are ribosomes, this is supposed to be a plasmid. This thin line is supposed to be the cell or plasma membrane, and then this red line that's labeled is the endotoxin, also known as the outer membrane or sometimes LPS, and we're not going to get into the chemistry in detail here. But in any case, this red structure is the cell wall, and in a gram-negative bacteria, part of the cell wall is called the endotoxin, and it's called that for a reason, because when this particular bacterium dies, then all the bits and pieces of the bacterium degrade and come apart, and those uh, little bits and pieces that are the endotoxin are poisonous to the person that is exposed to them. So a circumstance where you might be exposed to a bacterial endotoxin might be from, um, for example, a pathogenic uh, bacterium that has invaded you through eating contaminated food, and when this gets in your stomach, the presence of that endotoxin induces a fever, it makes you sick, and um, when those bacteria grow and they go through their life cycle within your body, every time a bacterium dies, they release the endotoxin, and that can actually be taken up and circulated by the bloodstream, you know, and be very poisonous and very harmful to a human. So here, endo, the term endo, endo means inside, okay? So it's a toxin that's like built into the cell structure of the bacterium itself. And that's different from what is called an exotoxin. So exo means outside. So here we have a bacterial cell, and I have drawn it similarly. So there's a chromosome, there's a plasmid, some little ribosomes. In here we imagine cytoplasm. This line going around here is the cell membrane. This thicker green bit is supposed to be the cell wall. And the cell wall in this particular case is not pathogenic, or it might be pathogenic, but we're not focusing on that right this second. And this, by the way, is supposed to be a capsule, this colored line running around the outside. And I've drawn this blue structure here 
to suggest that there's a portal or channel. And the little red things are supposed to be exotoxins. So these might be little bits of protein that this bacterium has made and it is excreting or secreting toxin, exotoxin, into the extracellular environment. And so if this is a pathogenic bacterium and it's growing inside a human, this poisonous material, this exotoxin, is toxic to that person, to the human host or patient, depending on your context, right? So an example of a really potent bacterial extra exotoxin that many of you might have heard of is called botulinum toxin or Botox. And it's an exotoxin made by a microbe called Clostridium botulinum. Very serious cause of pretty deadly food poisoning. So what happens is this organism, which lives naturally in soils, it gets on vegetable surfaces, and if the vegetables are improperly or incorrectly canned, the microbe Clostridium botulinum can grow and multiply, and as it does that, it produces botulinum toxin, one of the deadliest substances known to man, actually. And it comes in a few different forms, but if you eat that canned food, you'll be exposed to this toxin, and you can get pretty acutely sick from it, and you can even die from it. So there are pretty strict rules about canning, and it's a, something that's very important to get correct. We also use Botox to do things like um, alter the shape of our faces. So we use it cosmetically, and that's in teeny tiny doses of a slightly modified form. And the swelling that you see when someone inject, injects Botox into somebody's lips is a reaction to the toxin. So you're at, you are actually doing kind of a low-grade poisoning when you do that. Another example of an offensive factor or an attack factor that some bacteria have is the ability to grow very, very rapidly. So in previous classes, you learned a little bit about bacterial growth. So if you take bacteria and you put them in any closed environment, for example, in a human wound or in a human body or in a test tube or on a plate, a Petri plate, they're going to grow in a certain predictable fashion. So they're going to sit there for a while doing nothing other than copying and, and gathering up energy. And then they're going to start replicating through the process of binary fission. And they're going to do that really, really rapidly so that one bacterium becomes two and two bacterium become four and four become eight and so on. And so you can go from just a handful of bacteria to tens of thousands, if not millions, in a very short period of time, right? And this is called logarithmic or exponential growth, okay? So if that period of time can be measured in something like minutes, right? And this can actually happen particularly with bacteria like the one that I study called Vibrio vulnificus. It has a really, really rapid doubling time, the time that it takes to go from one to two. And so when you get Vibrio vulnificus in a wound, because you went swimming too soon after getting, you went swimming in the ocean too soon after getting a tattoo, for example, or maybe you're a fisherman and you accidentally cut your hand when you were like pulling a sea fish in. And if you're exposed to this bacterium, which is, this doesn't happen very often, it's pretty rare, but that particular microbe can get in your wound and one of its superpowers, one of its virulence factors, is the ability to grow really rapidly in the human body. And because it grows really rapidly, the human body just doesn't, does not have enough time to fight back, to mount a defense. And the bacterium can quickly get to numbers that can overwhelm and even kill the human. In fact, there's, in some cases, a mortality rate or a case fatality rate. CFR as high as 50% in some individuals when exposed to Vibrio vulnificus, certain demographic groups. So that ability to grow really, really rapidly in the human body, it's a, it's a virulence factor. Let's switch focus and think about a few defensive factors. So here we've got a bacterium 
and this red structure is the cell wall and I have not drawn a capsule on the outside of that cell wall. So this is just a bacterium in the human body, no capsule. And this is a macrophage and a macrophage is a human cell. It's a very important phagocyte meaning it is a cell that can do phagocytosis, right? And so that's the process happening here. So you were the human, you got a cut or something. This particular bacterium invaded this macrophage, detected this bacterium, and it engulfed it. And that's what happened over here and it's literally eating or degrading that bacterium. So we've got a dead bacterium and this clears or eliminates the bacterium from the host. Sorry for my messy handwriting, guys. Now let's look at what could happen if the bacterium has a capsule. Okay, so here I've drawn a back to the same bacterial cell, but I've added a capsule to it. Okay, and this macrophage actually now cannot engulf and phagocytose that bacterium. And the reason is, is that the capsule is thought to be a little bit slippery. And every time this macrophage tries to latch on and phagocytose this bacterial cell, this guy just keeps slipping away, it just keeps getting away. Okay, so trying to pick something up, like trying to pick a, up a watermelon seed, a slippery watermelon seed off a hard countertop. You just can't quite get your fingers around it, and the macrophage cannot engulf and destroy this. So there's no phagocytosis. The bacterium is not cleared, right? And you can get infection as a result. Okay, and this is something that a lot of different bacteria can make. So for example, there's a bacterium called um, Streptococcus pneumoniae. I bet you can guess what that causes. It can cause pneumonia in people and, and strains or versions of Streptococcus pneumoniae that can make a capsule are pathogenic while strains of Streptococcus pneumoniae that lack a capsule are not. And that has to do with the success or failure of phagocytosis by the macrophage of the human body. So um, another, sometimes, uh, sometimes another characteristic of bacterial pathogens that can enable virulence, that can serve as virulence factors, are the ability to get where you can infect in the human body. And so here we've got a bacterial cell and I have drawn in green a little twisty tail also known as a flagellum. And this little twisty tail or flagellum, flagella for plural, is able to propel or move this microbe in certain directions. And that allows the microbe to move, for example, towards food or away from a negative chemical stimulus. And that ability enables some microbes to be better at being pathogenic. It's, it can be a virulence factor. And so, for example, the microbe known as Proteus vulgaris is highly motile due to the flagellar structure that it contains, and it allows the flagella allow Proteus vulgara vulgaris to swim up the urinary tract. It's a common cause of UTIs. And that's kind of tricky because when this organism is down really, really low in the urinary tract, it does not cause infections. But when it swims up the urinary tract, if it has time to get up there before it's removed through the act of urination itself, as it swims up there, it's then able to access parts of the urinary tract, higher urinary tract, and then cause infection really um, successfully. Another example, I should have drawn you a better picture of this, but there are these bacteria that are shaped kind of like this. 
So that's not a flagellum, it's an actual bacterium. And inside these bacterium, that shape is called being spirochete. And these guys have their flagellum, make it green so you can see, okay? These guys have their flagellum on the inside, okay? It's called an endo for inside flagellum, any bacterium that's a spirochete shape. And this shape allows them to corkscrew. And this is like really, really gross, but the bacterium Borrelia, Bergdorferi, which causes Lyme disease, big problem in New England. We get it from a tick, from tick bites. Ticks carry Borrelia burgdorferi, and when a tick bites you and it injects Borrelia burgdorferi inside you, that bacterium will circulate through your body and it will use this shape and corkscrew ability that's a function of having an endoflagellum and it'll drill into connective tissue and get deep in the body, therefore avoiding antibiotics, which makes it really hard to get rid of. Lyme disease. Other defensive virulence factors include things like the ability to resist antibiotics. So here are two petri plates and the slimy yellowish beige stuff is some particular bacterium that's been spread all over the plate and we're going to actually do um, a lab experiment like this. And these little white things are paper discs soaked in antibiotics which are chemicals that kill bacteria and that are safe for humans to take, you know, internally to by injection or by oral consumption, for example. And we take them to treat bacterial infections. And so on this plate on the left, each of these white paper discs is, sh is soaked in a different antibiotic. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different antibiotics being tested here. And the clear areas around them show that the antibiotic is effectively killing this bacterium. So we're not seeing resistance to any of the antibiotics being tested on these little paper discs on this plate. In contrast over here, no resistance here, here, or here, but look at these guys down here. This microbe is able to go right up to and even maybe over top of the antibiotics that are on these paper discs. So that shows that this microbe is antibiotic resistant to whatever antibiotic is here, here, or here, and maybe just a little bit here as well. And this kind of resistance is considered a virulence factor because we rely on antibiotics, amongst other things, to treat um, bacterial infections. So just to not end on a negative note, because I just gave you several of ex examples of virulence factors, which is to say, how bacteria can be pathogenic, how, what, what aspects of their form or function are allowing them to be pathogenic. And, um, you know, that's what they've got to use to attack and infect us, the humans. But how do we combat those bacterial infections? We use antibiotics. Hopefully they work, right? Or in some cases, there are vaccinations that work. We don't always have vaccinations for all bacterial pathogens, but we do have some. Um, and we can try preventing infections in the first place. For example, we can treat our water, we can chlorinate water or treat it in other ways to remove bacterial pathogens. We can keep food under uh, sanitary conditions. We cook food to reduce microbial load, for example. We use fridges. We use temperature to control bacterial growth. We can, we can prevent the spread of bacteria that cause pathogenesis by hand washing and other and other means. And these are just a few of the ways that we can combat bacterial infections. And that concludes this video lecture.